you need to stay away from the takeaways. Are you sure about that, Alan? Are you sure? Are you sure? Oh, oh, no, oh, no, oh, yeah, yeah. Take his shirt off. Oh, look Whoa, at Whoa, look at that. I'm in fights. Look at Don't me. stand up, Micah. Don't stand up. Look at the size of his... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you once again for sending your questions. Um, we've got lots of them. There's some great ones I have to say this week. Um, yeah, and including the first one. I've got to start with this one. I think it's brilliant. From Anne Brown. As a funeral celebrant, my recurring nightmare finds me standing before a large congregation of mourners, all waiting for my words of comfort. But I have no idea who's died. <laughs> <laughs> as players... Are- as, as players and pundits, what recurring nightmares do you have? I have a recurring nightmare that I'm dead in the coffin <laughs> and the funeral celebrant doesn't know who I am. <laughs> uh, we've talked one or two times about our, our dreams and um, I, used, I used to have one where I couldn't get ready in time to get on the pitch. Um, I couldn't get my shin pads on or... Or I couldn't find my football boots, and every and the rest of the team be going out on the pitch, and I, I just couldn't get there. And the other one about just two yards out and couldn't score, and it kept coming back to me. And I hit the post, and it come back to me. And it get the keeper, and it come back to me. You couldn't score. Um, <laughs> yeah, we were the same. One, I was the same about the ball having a, not being able to get to a ball, and when it's just like half a yard out, and I can't get to it for whatever reason. Yeah. yeah. We need therapy. We do, yeah. We need help, yeah. Um, do I have a dream? We know Micah's, wasn't it, his dream? I don't, I don't want to know Micah's <laughs> dreams, actually. I really don't want to know Micah's dreams. <laughs> Let's just say it rhymes with bet and net. <laughs> <laughs> Bets, nets, <laughs> uh, jet. Oh, God, Gary's forgotten what those are. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I think we should move on at this point. Uh, Scott Hamilton has a question. He wants to know, what do we think about Messi winning FIFA's The Best Award? Uh, a lot of people are saying it's fixed but it was voted for by managers and captains. Am I right in saying the voting was meant to be January to January? Is that Was that correct? I believe it didn't eventually actually include the World Cup, right. um, which I, I, I find um, remarkable. Um, I mean, I'm as big a fan as you can get of Messi, obviously, but I mean, I, I must admit when I saw it come up, I was actually going to go to the best awards. Um, it, was, it was last Monday and it's... Um, it's really close to me. It's 10 minutes away, the Hammersmith Apollo. So I thought I was really looking forward to it. and um, But I felt awful, awful. And I, so I had to pull out. Um, I was going with producer Harry, actually. Um, and and when I saw that Messi had won it, I thought, oh, God, the fly me. It would have been great to be there. But, but he wasn't actually there. I think he was probably staggered he'd won it uh, as well. I think Haaland will feel a bit... Oh, yeah, yeah, but if it's from January to January, let, let's be honest, I, I was right. If it was, because obviously the, the World Cup was in the December, wasn't it? Yeah, but previously, so it didn't count for it. Of course Haaland should have won it. Of course of course he should. All football people know that. We, we've already said Messi's probably the greatest to ever do it. There's no hate coming from any of us lot ever. But if we're talking about a team that's just won the treble and someone who's just been instrumental in that, of course it should have been Haaland. All the players and coaches, they, they, they do all the votes. They all vote for it. So do you know what I mean? It's that, so, so it's hard to say, well, well, they should have. But Maybe the clue's in the title. It's called The Best Award. To be honest, <laughs> if you have to just vote for who is the best, um, then it, 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 it will always be him. But, you know, having said that, he, what, he had you know, kind of the last half of a season with with Paris Saint-Germain in which he was injured a little bit and then, he, then he's then he gone kind of semi-retirement really, if, realistically uh, speaking. Um, so, uh, yeah, I th- I've, I've felt for Erling Haaland cause, and it was also, it was they had absolutely the same votes, didn't it? And then it went to, I think the uh, deciding factor was the captain's votes were ahead of the manager's votes and he had, Messi had more captain's votes. 
So I mean, it's it's a, it's democratic. It's democratic. We should never mm. ever argue with democratic. Uh, <laughs> so, so much, so much fishy there. I don't know. <laughs> One from Richard Rouse who asks: Surely Dominic Solanke has to be called up to England based on his numbers this season. You have to see he's having a really really impressive season. Um, so is Ollie Watkins. Uh, my guess is he'll probably take two backups. And to, to Harry, like he'll take Watkins plus another. Now he's going he's gonna to be up against competition from Ivan Tony, Callum Wilson. Yeah, he's having a great season, but for England, if he if he continues to blast them in in between now and the end of the season, then I would say so. But then you also got to look at the form of the others. I was going to say the same thing, Alan. If he continues on this rich vein of form, but half a season's not enough in terms of um, becoming um, an international. Uh, player um you know but i mean obviously he did it in the championship then he struggled subsequently struggled at liverpool i think he has got one cap already though hasn't he he is an england international he has got one cap that's true bob fletcher he wants to know it's fascinating that micah does bbc and sky is there inter-channel team rivalry uh, do you borrow talking points or do you try to do or offer something different I mean, Alan, you work for Amazon as well as as the BBC. You work for Premier League Productions, mm -hmm. um, which is slightly different because it goes around the world. Yeah. Um, but what, what, yeah, you work for BBC and um, and Sky, Mike. Uh, yeah, CBS. I mean, obviously, and the rest, you prefer, CBS, obviously, you prefer TNT. working with us. Who else I don't does work he? For TNT. Yes, yeah, I've seen you. <laughs> I don't work for TNT. <laughs> Um, You've been on TNT as well? No, no, I don't know. I, I did one uh, Champions League game for TNT years and years ago, and then... CBS you do for the Champions CBS, League CBS, of course, with Kate Abdel, Cadiga, and Henri. Um, in the different out there, so BBC's uh, analytical programme, you see all the highlights of the games, and Sky is live games, so I see them as two different things. Um, it's always hard because people always say to me, what do you prefer, BBC or Sky? And I just say, I prefer them equally the same. The oh, old... Uh, Mr. Creosote is back. Give me some cream. Where's that cream? Creosote. What's it called, Creo? Creosote. Give me some of that Creosote, please. <laughs> <laughs> what people really want to know is, do you prefer Alan Shearer and me or Jamie Carragher and Gary Neville and Roy Keane? That's what they want to know. Oh, Roy, Roy Keane every day of the week. Well, f*** you. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, I'm on the phone. Hang on a minute. Good Just answer, mate. Yeah, good answer. Um, Ian Wright, would you like to make a transfer um, from that pod that you do and, 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 and swap with Michael Richard? Um, great. Okay, you're on next. No, I love you. I love you all the same. Oh, do one. The damage is done. The damage is done. <laughs> you, you two know where my loyalties lie. You, you know where they lie. Yeah, here's a good question for you, actually, Micah. What do you think of Omar Berada's Ooh. appointment to be the new CEO of Manchester United? Um, for those that don't know, he was at Barcelona for many mm -hmm. years um, and then he, he moved um, to Manchester City, where he's been for a while. He's been very successful at, at both clubs um, and I think he's going to Manchester United as, I think, Chief Operations Officer. Is that is that right? I know him very well. Really nice guy. He is... Uh, incredibly articulate. He's got a plan. So how it works at Man City, you'll have Cal Doom, who's chairman slash owner. Then you'll have Ferran, who takes care of not just Man City, but all the Man City group. So he was like yeah. the front man. CEO. Yeah, CEO, any yeah. speeches or any direction. And then you have... Cheeky, who is the football side, he concentrates... Who I played with. Yes, yes. Re Cheeky Begley Stein. Really great guy. He's just football yeah, he operations. So he does... Yeah. The, he's the one who gets the players and Omar... He's like the director of football. Yes, sort and of. Omar yeah. worked alongside him and Brian Marwood in terms of negotiating the deals, um dealing with the scouts and all that sort of thing. And I've listened to him talk and he's so inspirational. The way he knows the game, the way he knows the market, he's best, he's always thing. And, and Gary Neville says it a lot, but best in class in terms of 
getting every department to run the best that possibly can be. And it's not just his voice. He's happy to take sort of um, opinions from other people, put them all together and help build all the way from the ground up. So to see him go to Man United is a massive blow, but... Is that a shock to you? It, I mean, it, it, was, it definitely was a shock, but by all accounts, it was done amicably and they wish him well. I, I bet uh, they uh, don't. <laughs> well, they wish him well, but just not better. But it just shows you how far Man City have come in terms of organisation and how they run, how all the, the big clubs around the world now are trying to poach their staff. So it says a lot about him and a lot about the way Man City are doing things. I wonder if that's a, that, that kind of a major first major point for Jim Ratcliffe. I wonder if that was, I, I imagine it was his decision, Alan. Got to be. Mm -hmm. it? yeah, I mean, it's a bit of a coup for them after the way Man City have been the last few years. So yeah, big coup for them. That is, yeah, and a statement has to be his decision. Yeah, I would think so. Be fascinated to see if he makes a, a big difference at um, Manchester United. Before we take a break, question, oh, question for me from Stu's Football Flashback. After leaving for Japan at just 31 years old, do you regret not staying with Spurs and playing in the Premier League? No, I don't actually, because I was slowing down a little bit and I had a kind of... Um, I didn't know at the time because I'd, I'd already signed and agreed with the Japanese club um, and I played another eight months for Spurs af after that. <laughs> What are you laughing at? Come, oh, come it's the ours, bullshit, ours, guys. Ours. Come on, come on. <laughs> Forget You're... about the money, money, money. <laughs> yeah, the money, money, money. money. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, that was a substantial... Um, that was, yes, one of the major reasons. Uh, I, did going, but... <laughs> I did it for no, the money, money, money. I did it for the money, money, money. The main money. reason for me was, was growing the game of football in different <laughs> countries. <laughs> I had, a, I had a yen to do that. So, um, yeah. no, of course, it, of course. Yeah, no, no, but not at that stage because my powers are waning anyway. And um, so no, it, it, bought, it bought my house. Like, we didn't earn as much as they do now. Oh, How long was you there, Gaz? Two years? Uh, two years, but I didn't, I was, I got, um, I was, I had an injury in the in the period that I played for Spurs after I'd signed for them. Um, I had to finish that season. I got I had my first toe injury and I needed I had an operation after the season finished and I had a gap before I went to Japan, but it didn't really help. And then I had a bad injury after a few games that, that I played, so I didn't play that much. But it was still a great experience. Um, and I, I I enjoyed it and we're going to take a break now um, and during that period I'll count my yen Micah it was those stupid quasar boots that's what happened I, I had Essex in Japan oh, I had a okay. different deal <laughs> yeah yeah a question from Neil Woodlands it's good to see Ivan Tony back as he is a class footballer, but the commentary and adulation for him is, in my opinion, a little bit uncomfortable. Making him captain and all the focus for a guy who was caught doing wrong is not a good example for anyone, particularly youngsters. Thoughts. But there's also another question, because we sort of covered that, didn't we, a little bit uh, on our main episode, uh, from Benjamin Blackburn, who says, do you think the big show Brentford have put on for the return of Ivan Tony is just to raise his asking price in the transfer market? Seems excessive, seeing as he seems to want to move. Ooh. We sort of covered it a little bit the other day, but I don't know, I think Brent Brentford played it really well. They made it a big deal. They welcomed him back. He was captain. He came out. And it worked. They won a game. They needed to change change things, change the momentum. Um, so I, I don't criticise them. Yeah, yes, he was. Yeah, you know, yes, he error, was didn't he? done. Broke the rules. He made a mistake. Big punishment for it. Eight months out of football. It's a big, big punishment. Um, and he served it, and he was back. And I, what do you think? No, I agree. I'm, I agree with with what you've just said. I think. Yeah, I mean, there's there's probably an element of Brentford doing that. Um, in doing so, they know how good he is. Um, it's only going to put his price up. So, 
every club does that with a player, though, don't they? That that he's their well, he's, he's their big you? asset, absolutely. So, yeah, I, I, I got it and understood all of it, and I understood why they made him captain. Um, and it worked because he scored. He was man of the match. He helped them get three points, three massive points, which they needed and will go a long way to um, to survival for them uh, because they've got some tough fixtures coming up. So they had to win that game. So I got it and I understood all of it. I don't know how long he's got left of his, his contract, Micah, but how much do you think he'll go for? How much is he worth? Ooh. Considering when every time we talk on this podcast about who should a team sign up center forward, not, <laughs> yeah. not wide forward. Yeah, no. Then when we go, okay, Tony could be available. Osman could be available, then sign a new deal. And you're looking through it and you're thinking, well, there's not th- that much out there that could adapt to the Premier League when we're talking about that. You know, number nine could play all over, but who's ready-made for the Premier League. I've got one that could come back. Harry Kane could come back. And beat no, and beat he's not. Know. He's not coming back. No chance. <laughs> yep, yeah, stay away, yeah. Harry. Good lad. But just, just, just on that <laughs> that point when they said about role models, it, it, it's very difficult because you know when we're footballers, we we all we know is football, don't we? And everyone expects us to be articulate. Speak for yourself. Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we know about football and what uh, football's our life. And sometimes we've missed the basic, I don't know, skills. So you look at you guys now, you can cook or whatnot. I can cook and look after myself, but if you asked me to cook a meal, I, I wouldn't know where to start because all my energy has gone into, into <laughs> basically someone doing it for me, takeaways or me just making something quick and easy to see me through, you know? Um, so when you talk about role models, like it's, it's difficult when you talk about the, the betting thing, we don't know if Tony had an illness. Did he have a, you know, did he have a gambling pro? We, we, these are all things. And because we get put on this pedestal, like, oh, footballers, we're not. We're just like normal human beings, you know? So And young men, very young men that may, and young men make Yes, I mistake. agree. It is a, being a little bit over the top. But what I would just say is we're all human. He's made a mistake and... Is back to what he does best in scoring goals. What I would say is you need to stay away from the takeaways. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure about that, Alan? Are you sure? Are you sure? Oh, oh, no, oh, he 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 take his shirt off. Oh, look Whoa, at this. look at that. I'm in mean, fights. Don't stand up, Micah. Don't stand up. <laughs> You've been in the gym today, haven't you? I've been in the gym, <laughs> mate. For those of you who listen to the podcast and not the YouTube channel, uh, Micah has just peeled off his shirt. And and he's 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 looking a little bit chubby. Mm. Um, Look at the size of his tits. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, man! I've lost one of my earpods. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's underneath it. your bicep. I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. You've got it. He's back on. <laughs> Are you going to do the rest of this podcast naked? <laughs> I'll put it on. I'll put Frank it on. Heavens for that. There's a question here for you, Micah. Okay. And I, I know you're not at home at the moment, so you can't actually point it out. Um, but um, Zaid Aref, it's interesting to see the cabinet behind Micah gets oh. more in it each week, including books now. As someone that's worked on the brand, I'm interested to know what's in the purple Cadbury box behind oh. it. What are the most random awards you've each won? Thanks for a great pod. Thank you, Zaid. Was that a Cadbury's Man of the Match award or something, was it, Micah? <laughs> Do you know what it is? I know you're not at home, so you can't show us at the moment, but, and you can show us in the next episode. So basically, uh, me, uh, Man City, and Cadbury's did a little uh, collaboration where we, you know, would sell some chocolates, and the chocolate has actually got a, a picture of me in the chocolate. I'm sure you've done one, Alan, haven't you? No? But I, 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 I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Hang on, Alan. Alan looks a little bit, um, a little bit kind of bad. <laughs> what is it, Alan? I, no, no. Wait, I think is it. Yeah, it was. It was Cadbury's, wasn't it? The chocolate with your name on the front of it, wasn't it? Yes, on the, uh, yeah. yes. Yeah. So my name's imprinted in the chocolate. Did you know that when Alan was a child, that he was the Milky Bar Kid? <laughs> <laughs> the Milky 
Milky Bar Kid. That's a blast from the past, isn't you it? Remember that? Yeah. The Milky Bar Kid it is, is strong. You know, it is, strong. yeah. The best. It's good. And, have, sorry, we got, have we got pictures of that? A, have we got evidence? You need to be a. No, it's a oh! joke, Mike. He wasn't really the Milky Bar Kid. <laughs> he was McDonald's. He was everything else. You need to be of a certain age. Let's put it that way. You need to be of a certain <laughs> age. <laughs> uh, Jamie Leeson. Um, as an avid shirt collector, have there been any players that you've played with who are as excited about new kits as fans are? And what are your favourite all-time best and worst kits you've worn, Ooh. domestic or international? It was quite nice pulling on that Barcelona <laughs> <laughs> shirt. Barcelona maker. Shock! I mean, we've all worn the England shirt, which is the most special thing, but I think he means in terms of the, perhaps the style or... Um, I mean, I I don't think I never we did used to think back in our day we never thought like that we used to put it on and um, Mike I, I imagine you're, you you would have been quite keen on what the shirt looked like. You know what my first football shirt was back in the days, a Newcastle United jersey. Yes. Was it really? Was it was it the brown eel one or the collared up the, the three the, three buttons? The three buttons. Yeah, the brownie. That's my favourite one, though. That is, is. That's when I signed in '96. Don't tell me that. I'm not that old, am I? <laughs> You're '96. Oh, wow. so I was born in '88, and that was my that was my first jersey, new cut. And I was oh, it was unbelievable. That was a great kit, wasn't it? How old were you? Um, I was. I would have been eight, wouldn't I? It was '96, '88. Yeah, I would have been eight. Yeah. Yeah, six plus two is eight. Yeah. <laughs> So are you going to add Newcastle United to one of the many teams that you now support? Two, two, two. Two, two, two. <laughs> Pushing for an ambassadorial role at Newcastle now. Look at him. <laughs> hey, the Jordies love me. You know that. When I went up there, honestly, the hospitality was fantastic. Everyone loves big meeks. <laughs> love that. Kevin. Hi, guys. Love the podcast. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, my question is, if you could swap your careers for one of your heroes' careers, would you? And why? Yes, I'd swap for, I don't know, Messi, Maradona, the two Ronaldos, Zidane, Platini, Roy, <laughs> De Bruyne, <laughs> <laughs> Salah. Um, well, yeah, the the yeah. list goes on. <laughs> Although I'm quite satisfied with, 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 with what What about another sport, um, though? What about some... Would you swap it for oh, a, yeah. another, another sport? Oh, Golf uh, or something like that, sport. would it? No? Joe Root. Oh, oh Tiger Woods. Nah. Tiger. Oh, imagine being Tiger Michael Woods. Jordan. Oh, is it... A, a, I played golf with Michael Jordan. Oh, I told you did, that, you, didn't did you do a story on that? Did you? So it's going back, oh, quite a long time, um, 20 odd years ago, just kind of the absolute latter stages of uh, Michael Jordan's career. Um, and John Holmes, my agent, who was on the podcast as a guest, um, was um, his company was bought out by Americans and they, they were part of the group that looked after Michael Jordan. He got a phone call on a Thursday evening, um, and it was um, it was a it was a summer. That's right. So that's why I wasn't I wasn't playing football. Um, or no, I wasn't playing then. I wasn't um, working on football at, at at that particular time of the year. So he calls me and he says, "I've had um, um, the office in America on, and Michael Jordan's coming over," and. He wants to play golf at Sunningdale. Now, I lived in Sunningdale and I was a member of Sunningdale. Um, and I went, oh, wow. He said, yeah, but there's three of them. I went, OK. Um, um, he'll have to play with a member, though, um, because you, at the weekend, you, you, there's no way you can get on or any time at Sunningdale unless you play with a, with a member. So I said, but I'm perfectly happy to play with them <laughs> um, and host them as my guests. And he went, he got in touch with them um, and they said, that's fantastic. Okay, 9 a.m. Saturday morning. So I went to the club, sorted it out. Um, and it, well, I was set to play with, with Michael Jordan, which was, was very <laughs> exciting. I get a phone call and um, from John Holmes again, he said, um, slight problem. There's now six <gasps> of them. So I went, wow. Um, okay, um, I need to find another member. <laughs> I said, I need to find another member. I'll call Michael King, who we all called Queenie. He was kind of an old, um, he'd been around a while, played really good golf, used to be a pro golfer on the tour, um, exceptional player um, and, and a great guy. So I, I called Queenie and I went, 
this has happened, blah, blah, blah. Can you come along? Oh, of course. Right, quite posh. You know. Of course, yes, I'll be there. I'll be there. Yes, yes, lovely. Can't wait. So anyway, so I turn up. I go there early. I get there at half eight. I walk into the it's into the office and, and Keith, the, uh, the the pro at the time, he says, um, he said, um, your friends are all here. I went, oh, great. So I, I walk out in the, uh, the putting green and there were like six huge guys, uh, all big black guys, all with cigars, all putting on the putting green, all like this. And there were a few members, you can imagine, <laughs> Sunningdale's like, you know, the quintessential <laughs> white golf club and they're all, and, you, and they're all going, <laughs> I'm not sure what this is. <laughs> anyway, so... <laughs> So, so I walked over, I introduced myself, and it was like Michael Jordan, two or three other basketball players. Um, Samuel L. Jackson Whoa. was also um, one of them. And um, so anyway, so we, so I organized it all. And we got to the first tee, that, and we had separated into two four balls, but we were all eight of us on the first tee. I'm playing with Michael Jordan and Samuel Jackson, blah, blah, blah. And we we separate up. And, and Queenie, he's, he likes a bet. And he's kind of, <laughs> he's he's quite a good gambler. Let's say on the golf course, he's quite canny. So he said, um, "Sir," he said, um, "Do do we want a little wager on this?" <laughs> and uh, so my, Michael Jordan puffs on his cigar and he went, "Sure, man." And um, Queenie said, "Okay." He said, "So, um, how much would you like to pay?" <laughs> <laughs> and Jordan has a big puff on his cigar and he goes. Whatever makes you feel uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> and that is my Michael Jordan. Oh really. my God. Uh, it's a good way to finish, I think. Well, we finished on the 18th and um, Michael Jordan beat me. Actually, <sighs> but there we go. How much did you lose? Can you remember? I only know this because um, I, I did that story on, on Twitter uh, three or four years ago. Um, and and Michael King called me. Queenie called me, and he said, "He said I've um, I've had the times on, and they they want to um, talk to me about that day we had at Sunningdale." He said, "But I wanted to check with you. It was okay first. And I said, "Of course it's okay. It was very great." He said, "Is it okay if I tell them about what happened the following day?" And I went, <laughs> and "I went, oh right." And I didn't know. He went, "Yes." He said, "And um, <laughs> let's just say I I fleeced him for a few thousand. <laughs> <laughs> Three thousand. <did he? laughs> I went. Oh, well done, you. He said yes. He said, but and um, is it okay if I tell the story? I said, yeah, of course. I don't think that's a problem. He said, yeah. He said at the end of the game, he said we were all there, we were having a few drinks, and he said we'd had these bets, and he said, um, he said, and then they were preparing to leave, and he said, and I thought, do I say anything or do I not? And he said, and he, I went, well, what did you say? He said, well, I said to him, I said. Mr. Jordan, he said, in this country, when we play for money, we do tend to pay our debt. <laughs> <laughs> he said he went to the car and he, he said his driver brought over £2,000 or something. And paid no it. way. <laughs> Absolutely sensational. Oh, Classic God. Queenie for those that, that... I know a few people will know him. But he's an absolute legend. <laughs> what a great story. Uh, thank you very much again for uh, for all your questions. We'll be back um, later in the week with our uh, Friday episodes. But until then, goodbye. Goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. 